Good evening, everyone. We want to welcome you to our midweek service. Tonight is really a special evening. Our young men are going to be conducting our worship service again tonight. And we have a great lineup of young boys and young men that are going to be conducting their scripture reading, leading songs, and making some short talks. So uh, they're all prepared, and I hope that you are. Their names are going to appear on the screen to the left and the right. And so if you don't quite know who is who, you can uh, put those two together. There's going to be some uh, wonderful talks tonight, and uh, we want to encourage these young men as much as we can. So first off tonight, we have Aiden Waller. He's going to be leading us in How Great Thou Art. Tree Church Christ in Waxahachie, Texas. Tonight I will be leading How Great Thou Art, verses 1 and 4. Again, verse 1 and 4, page 7. My name is Tanner Rochelle. I'm from the Brown Street Church of Christ in Waxahachie, Texas. Tonight, I'll be reading Jeremiah 31, 31 through 37. Again, that is Jeremiah 31, 31 through 37. Behold, the days are a new covenant with Israel in the house of Judah. The covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand and bring them out of the land of Israel, Egypt. My covenant that they broke through I was their husband, declares the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of the Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, for the least of them to the greatest. 
declares the Lord, for I will forgive their equality and will remember their sin no more. And thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day and fix order of the moon and stars by, for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that the waves roar, the Lord of hosts in his name, if this fixed order departs from me, before me, declares the Lord, then shall the offspring of Israel cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if the heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth below can be explored, then I will cast off all the offspring of Israel for all that they have done, declares the Lord. Thank you. is a lamp to my feet and is a light to my path. One nineteen one o five. Love the Lord your God. Do the next word. Love the Lord your God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Daddy. That I want me with all your soul, with all your mind, Matthew twenty two forty seven. Hello, my name is Hayden Kahn from the Brown Street Church of Christ in Waxahachie, Texas. And tonight I'll be reading Hebrews 8, 16, 6 through 13. Again, that is Hebrews 8, 6 through 13. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent that than that the old as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises for if that first covenant had been faultless there would there would have been no occasion to look for a second for he finds fault with them when he says behold the days are coming declares the lord when i will establish a new covenant with the house of israel and with the house of judah not like the covenant that i made with their fathers on the day when i took them by the by the hand to bring them out of the land of egypt for they did not continue in my covenant, and so I showed no concern for them, declares my Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. For after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds and write them into their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people and they shall be my and they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one shall his brother say no saying know the lord for they shall all know me 
for the least of them to the greatest, for I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete, and what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Good evening. My name is Hudson Beagler, and I'm from the Brown Street Church of Christ in Waxhatchee, Texas. Last November, my dad and little brother went hunting for elk up in Colorado. They arrived to find a large area of burnt wilderness where they normally hunt closed for the season. The fire pushed many animals out of the area during the summer and fall months to ensure safe passage for the animals that have been displaced. The Forestry Service kept the area closed during the hunting season. We felt as though the animals knew this area was a refuge in the storm of life and it quickly became a sanctuary, a place that they could rest and not be hunted, a place they could eat and not be disturbed, a place that they did not, to hurt to, they did not have to hurry through in order to get back to their normal winter range. Needless to say, my father and brother returned home with no elk. Can a sanctuary be created and shared? Have you ever been there for a friend who's going through a really hard time in their life? Were you a sanctuary for that friend, a judgment-free zone for them to open up in? Read with me Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24. Again, that is Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24. A man who is friends must himself be friendly, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. It's easy to be there for a brother or a good friend, but let's take it a step further. Have you ever been there have you ever been there for a complete stranger or someone you don't know very well? In the second chapter of the book of Joshua, it talks of a harlot named Rahab who provided shelter for two complete strangers. Joshua sent two spies to view, to view the land of Jericho, and the king was in search of these spies. Rahab hid them and helped them escape by laying them down the city wall. God then spared her family when the city was destroyed by Israel. This isn't the first instance in the Bible when someone provided hospitality to people in need. An account in the book of Genesis took this, took this a step further, and it said gave two angels. A man named Lot provided sanctuary for two angels. Read with me Genesis chapter 19, verses 1 through 3. Again, that's Genesis chapter 19, verses 1 through 3. Now the angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Here, now, my lords, please turn in your servant's house and spend the night, and wash your feet. Then you may arise early and go on your way. Then they said, No, but we will spend the night in the open square. But he insisted strongly, so they turned into him and entered his house. And then he made a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Lot gave the angels a place to stay, and in return, they spared his family when they destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Have you ever given any thought to eternal sanctuary? Follow along with me in John chapter 18, verse 36. Again, there's John chapter 18, verse 36. This is when Jesus is on trial and Pilate is questioning him. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Jesus was not of this world, and he knew it. He was homeless by earthly standards. He offered himself as a sacrifice so that each and every one of us, as a sacrifice that can save each and every one of us. This eternal sanctuary is one that we should all strive to enter into because the things of this life are fleeting and temporary. In John chapter 14, verse 6, it reads, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is only one way to get to heaven, and it is stated that the only way is through him. So believing that Jesus is God's one and only Son and putting him on in baptism and living your life for Jesus will ensure you a place in the eternal sanctuary that is heaven. Where will you find sanctuary? Thank you. Hello, 
My name is Bradley Medford from the Brown Street Church of Christ, Waxahachie, Texas. Tonight, I will be reading Psalms 46. Again, that is Psalms 46 from the NIV. God is our refuge and strength in ever-present help and trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth, he makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Reed Stewart, and I'm a member at the Brown Street Church of Christ in Waxahachie, Texas. Tonight, I'll be reading Romans 6, 1 through 14, out of the English Standard Version. Again, that's Romans 6, 1 through 14, out of the ESV. Dead to sin, alive to God. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who die to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as he was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a, res in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For the one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Thank you.
name is Cameron Medford, and I'm from the Brown Street Church of Christ in Waxahachie, Texas. And tonight, I'll be reading Hebrews 9, 22 through 28. Again, that is Hebrews 9, 22 through 28 in the NIV. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world, but he has, but he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as people are designed to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are eagerly waiting for him. Thank you. My name is Noah Miner from the Brown Street Church of Christ in Waxahachie, Texas. Tonight, I will be reading for you James 12, James 5, I mean, James 5, 13 through 20. Are you having troubles? You should pray. Are you happy? You should sing. Are you sick? Ask the elders of the church to come rub oil on you in the name of the Lord and pray for you. If such prayer is offered in faith, it will heal anyone who is sick. The Lord will heal them, and if they have sinned, he will forgive them. So always tell each other the wrong things you have done. Then pray for each other. Do this so that God can heal you. Anyone who lives the way God wants can pray, and great things will happen. Elijah was a person just like us. He prayed that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Then Elijah prayed that it would rain, and the rain came down from the sky, and the land grew crops again. My brothers and sisters, if anyone wanders away from the truth and someone helps that person come back, remember this. Anyone who brings a sinner back from the wrong way will save that person from eternal death and cause many sins to be forgiven. Hello, my name is Ryan Fletcher from the Brown Street Church of Christ in Waxahachie, Texas. So for most of us know that this year's LTC theme is sanctuary. And for a lot of us, we have sanctuary with God and knowing that we will go to heaven one day. At the same time, we have what we call our own or earthly sanctuaries or safe places where we can go here. This could be a room in our house, a, a place outside, or even doing activity like sports or fine arts. But yet, no matter how hard we try to stay in these safe or comfortable situ situations or places that we have, we still have situations where we are uncomfortable and, sh and we have struggles and there's nothing that we can do about them. For some people, this happens when, for some, this could happen when you get tired, depressed, and disappointed, and it's hard for you to get back up on your feet and keep on going. Most people, for most people my age, we have a lots of different tough situations. This could be, an example, at school, teenagers have friend troubles, academic struggles, and peer pressure you have to deal with every single day. For some of us, that could be a bad part of a day, or it could be a hard thing at work that we have to deal with, or even a tough question on a test that we don't know, even when you study and you feel confident about, about it and you still don't know the answer. And in those situations is when we don't put enough trust in God for some. And that's when we need him most. Those uncomfortable situations. But those hard times is when we need to find that sanctuary with God. 
If you will, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 41 uh, in verse 10. It says, Fear not, I am with you. Be not disamed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. The reassurance that God is always with us and we can find that comfort in him is repeated multiple times throughout the Bible. Yet we often forget to fully trust in him and ask him for his help when we need him the most. Another good example is, not, though not biblical, is the poem Footprints. It's a great example of how most people travel through life. In the poem, in the, poem the man is walking through the beach reflecting upon his life and he sees two sets of footprints in the sand. One set representing him and the other representing the Lord. When he sees the, le- when he sees the last scene of his life flash before him. In the poem it says, He looked back at the footprints in the sand and he noticed that many times along the path of his life there was only one set of footprints. He also noticed that it happened at the very lowest and saddest times of his life. The poem continues with the man questioning God about why he would leave him at such troublesome times in his life. He thought that once he accepted Jesus and began his Christian journey that God would always be with him. The poem is a good analogy that reminds us that even though we have accepted Jesus and are living a Christian life, we still have hard times and struggles that we may have to deal with. The ending of the poem, although... is not as well as scriptural, it is a beautiful way to summarize how God feels about us each day. It says, My precious, precious child, I love you and I would never leave you during your times of trial and suffering. When you see only one set of footprints, that is when I carried you. The poem is a great example that no matter what you are going through or what situation you may be in, you can find that comfort and sanctuary in God. The poem reminds me of many verses throughout the Bible of God's loyalty and desire to seek us and to help us. One of those examples is just a few pages later, Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2. It says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you, for I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Just like the man in the poem questioning God during his tough times, we often do the same and forget to trust him and completely rely on God. No matter what a person is going through or even something as simple as a tough thing at work or a question on a test you don't know, God will always be beside you and guiding us along the way of life and we need to trust him and seek his sanctuary in his word. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Ryan Stewart, and I'm a member at the Brown Street Church of Christ in Waxahachie, Texas. Tonight I'll be, I'll, be, I'll be singing page 749, The Battle Belongs to the Lord, verses 1 and 3. Again, that is page 749, The Battle Belongs to the Lord, verses 1 and 3.
Hello, my name is Aiden Bazzardio from the Bronx Church of Christ in Waxahachie, Texas. Tonight, I will be reading James chapter 4, verse 1 through 10 in the easy-to-read version. And this is about give yourselves to God. Do you know where your fights and arguments come from? They come from the selfish desire that may grow inside you. You want things, but you don't get them. So you kill, and you are jealous of others. But you still cannot get what you want, so you argue and fight. You don't get what you want because you don't ask God. Or well, yes, when you ask, you don't receive anything because the reason you ask is wrong. You only want to use it for your own pleasure. You people are not faithful to God. You should know what loving with the world is the same as hating God. So anyone who wants to be friends with the evil world becomes God's enemy. Do you think the scriptures mean nothing? The scripture says God says the spirit God made to live in us on us only for himself but the kindness God shows is greater as the scripture says God is against the proud but he is kind to the humble so give yourselves to God stand against the devil and he will run away from you Come near to God, and he will come near to you. You are sinners, so clean sin out of your lives. You are trying to follow God and the world at the same time. Make your thinking poor. Be sad, be sorry, and crying. Change your laughter into crying. Change your joy into sadness. Be humble before the Lord, and he will make you great. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Keegan Underwood, and I'm from the Brown Street Church of Christ in Waxahachie, Texas. And tonight, I'll be reading Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. Once again, that is Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 14 from the English Standard Version. If you would, please rise for the reading of God's Word. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Thank you. You may be seated. Good evening. My name is Reed Stewart, and I'm a member of the Brown Street Church of Christ in Waxahachie, Texas. Tonight, I'll be leading page six, page 867 to Canaan's Land. Again, that's 867 to Canaan's Land, verses 1 and 4.
Hello, my name is Graham Hazlip, and I'm from the Brown Street Church of Christ in Waxhatchee, Texas. Tonight, I'll be reading Matthew chapter 28, verses 11 through 20. Once again, that is Matthew chapter 28, verses 11 through 20, at the English Standard Version. And this is about the bribing of the guards. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people, his disciples came by the night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes in the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the, to the end of the age. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Ryan Stewart, and I'm a member at the Brown Street Church of Christ in Waxhachie, Texas. Tonight, I'll be reading Psalms 115. Again, that's Psalms 115, and this script, and this passage about of Scripture is about to Your name give the glory, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to Your name give the glory, for the sake of Your steadfast love and Your faithfulness. Why should the nations say, Where is their God? Our God is in the heavens, he does all he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but do not speak. They have eyes, but do not see. They have ears, but do not hear. Noses, but do not smell. They have hands, but do not feel. They have feet, but do not walk. And they do not make a sound out of their throat. Those who make them become like them, so do all who trust in them. O oh, Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O oh, house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The Lord has remembered us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both small and great. May the Lord give you increase, you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord, who made heaven and earth. The heavens are the Lord's heavens, but the earth has been given to the children of man. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor do those who go down to his silence. But we will bless the Lord, the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Hello, my name is Hayden Kahn from the Brown Street Church of Christ in Waxhatchee, Texas, and today I'll be talking about unity. My youth minister recently spoke to me, uh, spoke to our youth group about, spoke to our youth group, and it really sp stuck to me, stuck with me. He said that is. he said that as a youth group, we're a bunch of good individuals, but if we come together, we could be a really good youth group. This reminds me of John seventeen twenty through 23. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that they so that the world may be may believe that you sent me the glory you have given me i given to them that they may be one given as we are one i in them and you in me that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me 
and love them even as you loved me. This tells me that to be a church, we must be like-minded. Jesus is the Son of God, and he died on the cruel cross that we may be saved and have everlasting life with him. Once we are baptized into this family or church, we are one with him just as he is one with the Father. His desire for us is to be faithful as an individual, but use our talents for him as a church to bring others the truth and show them God's love. I'm no Michael Jordan, but I like to play basketball. Now, I'd be a better player if I was, if he was on my team. He would still be the best player, but he still needs a teammate. He'd make my game better, even if I'm not the best. The key is I must do my part. God has granted me some skills or talents. I don't want to be the one that buries my talent like the wicked and slothful servant in Matthew 25, 14 through 30. Jesus tells us about a a master that leaves on a journey. He leaves five talents with one servant, two talents with another and one talent with the last. The servants with the five talents and the two talents doubled their talents. But the servant with the one talent hid his talent in the ground because the the servant with the one talent did nothing with it and it was taken from him and given to the servant that had ten talents. I want to be like the other servants and double what God has given to me. It means I must work daily to be a better person. I must grow. I want to reach out to others and make them comfortable make them comfortable and know that Christ is with them and is our sanctuary. In times of trouble, I like to go to my life verse, Isaiah 41.10. You are my servant. I have chosen you and I not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God is my sanctuary. This is comforting to me. The church should be comforting to me to Christians. With people, this is difficult, but with God, we can accomplish this together. We each have to use our talents. I must trust that if each person we can use, we will use their talents to help me along my path, and I should help those who need my strength. If you are here as a visitor or need to know or study more about God, let me know and I can study with you. I could be a friend just like Jesus is to me. Hello, my name is Hudson Waller from the Brown Street Church of Christ in Waxahachie, Texas. Today, I'll be leading songs, page number 18, Faithful Love, verses 1 and 2. Again, that's Faithful Love, page 18, verses 1 and 2.
Hello, my name is Drake Scott from the Brown Street Church of Christ in Waxahachie, Texas. Tonight, I will be reading Psalms 23. Again, that's Psalms 23. Please turn with me now. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He was, he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you. Hello, my name is Grant Hobbs, and I'm from the Brown Street Church of Christ in Waxhatchee, Texas. Tonight, I'll be reading Psalm chapter 118, verses 1 through 19. Once again, this is Psalm chapter 118, verses 1 through 19. This is about the steadfast love of the Lord. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear, for what can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All nations surround me. In the name of the Lord I cut them off. They surround me, surround me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surround me like bees. They went out like a fire among thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open me to the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Keegan Underwood, and I'm from the Brown Street Church of Christ in Waxahachie, Texas. According to Merriam-Webster, a sanctuary is a place of refuge and protection. In today's lingo, we call that a safe place. These are very natural to the existence of the human race. As a baby, our mother is our safe place. We literally live inside of her for about nine months. After birth, she feeds us, holds us, cleans us, and basically takes care of our every need. For the first few years of our life, we are absolutely miserable when she's not by our very side. Also, our fathers are with our, our safe place as our main protectors, teaching us and helping us through our many problems. As we get even older, our teachers and administrators try to make schools a safe place by attending our every need and trying to create a very hospitable environment. When we join the workforce, companies try to create a safe place for employers, employees and customers through alarms and other measures to keep us secure. All of these things are there to help create a safe environment for people. As I previously mentioned, these are very natural to the human race. Throughout the Bible, we are told about many different people finding refuge and sanctuary in many places. 
The second account in the entire Bible is about Adam and Eve living in the Garden of Eden, a place safeguarded by God himself. God created them, and he created a place of protection for them, where he could walk with them forever. In order to stay there, they had one rule to follow. If you would, turn with me to Genesis chapter 2, and follow as I read verses 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Wow. They're promised death if they eat of the tree which God forbade. And from there we know what happens. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, Adam and Eve give in to the temptation and eat of the tree. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 23, God kicks them out of the Garden of Eden because of their sin. Later in the book of Genesis, we're introduced to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. You see, these two cities were very prosperous. According to Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49, they had an abundance of food and wealth. They were financially stable. There's nothing to worry about, right? One may think that, but quite the opposite was the case. In Genesis chapter 19, Lot sees two men while sitting at the gate of Sodom. If you would, turn with me to Genesis chapter 19. And follow as I read verses 4 through 7. But before they laid down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house. And they called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us, that we may know them. Lot went out to the men at the entrance, shut the door after him, and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. It doesn't say a few men, but every single person in the city wanted to commit vile and wicked acts against these men. The city, although prosperous financially, was incredibly sinful. Please turn with me later in the chapter to verses 24 and 25. There the Bible says, Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven, and he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. Because of their great sin, God completely destroyed the two cities from top to bottom. Now you may ask what these two accounts mean to us now. Well, just like Sodom and Gomorrah, we happen to live in a very prosperous and materialistic society. In just the last 30 years, Christianity has dropped almost 30% in the United States of America, the country where God has blessed religious freedom, free from governmental persecution, so that we could freely worship him. I say this to alert you that we as a country are headed down a miserable path of sin. That path has been mapped out in previous kingdoms such as Sodom and Gomorrah. That will lead to the destruction of this country. Church, this world is sick. This world is dying. And God has commanded us, his servants, to go out and protect them and heal them. If you would, turn with me all the way to Matthew chapter 28. And follow as I read verses 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, to the end of the age. God has commanded us Christians to make disciples of him everywhere. Given the downward trend of Christianity, not just in the United States, but also the world, we are not doing a great job right now, but we can change that by showing this world that the only way to a true everlasting sanctuary is through Jesus Christ. In conclusion, we can have all the money, we can have all the material things of this world, but without entering Jesus' sanctuary, we're destined for death because of our sin. But through baptism into Jesus' death and resurrection, we are offered a chance to be part of an everlasting sanctuary with him. If you would like to join that sanctuary through baptism, or if you would like the prayers of this church, come now as we stand and as we sing.
Well, I'm not asking for applause tonight, but I do want to ask the church, are you more pleased with the future of the church tonight? Can you say amen? amen? All right, Walter, if you'll make your way up for just a moment, I'm going to ask one of our elders to lead us in a closing prayer. Guys, good job tonight. Thank you, parents. Thank you for bringing your children every Wednesday night for several weeks and working diligently. Look forward to LTC this weekend and all of our kids, boys and girls, will do wonderful jobs. Walter. Let's bow out this time, please. Our dear Lord God, Father, thank you for this night. Father, thank you for these young men, for all of their hard work that they've done, Father. Father, we know that this is difficult. It's difficult for young men to get up in front of people and to do anything, Father. And we're so thankful for this group that's here. They work so hard. And Father, we just know that you're pleased by the work that they've done. Father, we pray that you'll be with them as they go into this LTC ceremonies this weekend, that you'll give them strength, that you give them confidence. You'll help them to feel good about what they're doing and give them a good recollection of, of all the things they need to say. Father, we're thankful for the teachers that have helped them, the ones that have been working with them. We're thankful for the parents that have spent time up here making sure that they were here. Father, it's such a blessing to see this and, and, and it's so encouraging to think about the young men that will be taking over the leadership roles as we go on through the next few years. And Father, we just thank you for this opportunity where you pray you'll be with us as we leave this place. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Oh, oh, how good.